I tell you what, it's, it's not, not like, like the, the olden days. days. I'm Rosie. I'm Jake. Welcome to our podcast on Ghostbusters. We're going to be talking about the two movies and the two cartoon series. And to give you a unique perspective, what I thought would be rather fun would be if we talked about them in the order that we saw them, which is... The Real Ghostbusters cartoon series, Ghostbusters 2, the movie, Ghostbusters, the original movie, and Extreme Ghostbusters, the follow-up cartoon series to The Real Ghostbusters. How crazy is that? Well, I have to admit, I don't have a great many memories of watching The Real Ghostbusters. Do you, Jake? The Real Ghostbusters was shown on children's ICV when we were young. In fact, it used to be shown on the same day as Nightmare, my favourite programme, during Nightmare's first series. But I remember The Real Ghostbusters cartoon as something I would watch if I really didn't have anything else to do. Well... I have to say, it seems to me that you always decided what we were going to watch. So I suppose I watched it when you didn't really have anything else to do as well. Uh, I remember that Peter Venkman was my favourite. Yes, me too, and I also thought Ray was funny. Ray stands. I don't remember having any opinion on Ray. Sorry, Ray. Um... I used to think Egon was terribly boring, but of course, uh, in later life, you discover that Egon's actually the most interesting one, don't you? Egon has a great many fans. Time for a shout-out to Fritz, I think. Hi, Fritz. Fritz is, of course, Egon's number one fan, and he is the chief Egon and Janine shipper. So we'll mention at this point that there'll be a link to Fritz's website in the description for this podcast. I say a link, of course, it's actually a URL that you can copy and paste. When we said link last time, I didn't realise that you couldn't actually make web links on our host site. And, of course, there's the link to Rose's Extreme Ghostbusters fan site, which also has contributions from me. So going back to the real Ghostbusters, I would sit and watch it. I never found it that funny or engaging which a lot of people, as we now know from Fritz's website and forums and things, did. But it was never a favourite and never something I'd go out of my way to watch. Speaking of Egon and Janine, Jake, do you have a confession to make? Yes, well, I don't seem to have picked up from the cartoon when I was young that Egon and Janine, who of course is the Ghostbusters receptionist and general clerical... Administrator. ...were having a romantic relationship... Now, this is a very big thing in the real Ghostbusters cartoon, and a lot of people find it very appealing, but it just never seemed to strike a chord with me, like the cartoon in itself, I suppose. That's something I did notice. Actually, I I don't want to upset anyone. You have to remember, I was very young. How old was I? Well, the series started in 1986 in the US, didn't it? And I know for a fact that it was on in 1987 here, because that was when Nightmare started. So you were two and up, but probably no older than eight or nine by the time CITV stopped showing it. Okay, so when I was aged about two to eight, I wasn't very old. I only noticed that she liked him. I'm sorry, I didn't notice that it was reciprocated. But actually... Uh, within living memory, when I first got involved with the online community, they had some real Ghostbusters episodes on a cable channel, and I watched some of them, and I could see, yes, it's true, Egon returns her feelings even though he can't yet come to terms with them. And I was a little older. I think I was in my late teens. Yes, Egon is one of these people who finds expressing himself in conventional ways, like everyone else does, rather difficult and can't really come to terms with it. So that's why you might not notice, if you're not digging a little deeper into the cartoon, that he and Janine are having a two-way relationship. But it's also why people who do notice find it appealing, I think. Indeed. So perhaps we'll talk a bit more about Egon and Janine when we talk about the first film. I think so. Well, I saw Ghostbusters 2 as a child who had been watching the real Ghostbusters, as did you, I I should think. Yes, indeed. And I think, from that perspective, it's very acceptable, isn't it? Ghostbusters 2 is a very accessible film for children. 
particularly children who are fans of the real Ghostbusters, which is not true to the same extent of the original film Ghostbusters. Clearly, making Ghostbusters 2, which came out in 1989, by the way, the filmmakers, probably principally Dan Aykroyd and Harold Ramis, who created and wrote the films and came up with all the characters and played two of the Ghostbusters, Ray and Egon, had acknowledged the popularity of the cartoon series and worked some aspects of it into the sequel film because they were going to want it to appeal to the cartoon audience, as well as fans of the first Ghostbusters film, which is why it's a coherent sequel or carry-on to both those previous Ghostbusters outings. For instance, Winston appears very early on in the film with Ray, and they're clearly an awesome foursome, just like they are in the cartoon, the four Ghostbusters. Which is very different from the first film, as we'll say in a moment, I'm sure. Yes. Speaking of Winston, I actually enjoyed him uh, when I watched those episodes that I was talking about in my late teens. Uh, More than I did as a child. He said some things which amused me, I seem to remember. I'll get some cups. That was hilarious. The real Ghostbusters did a lot for Winston. Perhaps gave him some of the screen time and developed him in some of the possible ways that the first movie didn't really bother with. But we're not talking about the first movie yet, are we? No. So I think, yes, Winston's development in the cartoon has a lot to do with his greater prominence in the second movie. Very competently and amusingly played by Ernie Hudson in both movies, of course, but I think he's given a lot more to work with in Ghostbusters 2. I agree with you. Another character who benefits from the real Ghostbusters is Simer, of course. No way would he have been in Ghostbusters 2 if he hadn't been their pet ghost in the real Ghostbusters. And of course, fans of Simer in the real Ghostbusters might have been slightly disappointed that he doesn't actually interact with the Ghostbusters themselves in Ghostbusters 2, but he does have this relationship going on with Lewis Tully, who's played by Rick Moranis, and works for the Ghostbusters in Ghostbusters 2. Which apparently I have read there were a lot of scenes that were cut from the film of Lewis and Slimer doing amusing things together and Lewis being scared by Slimer. But the relationship's still in there and you can see it. And fans of the cartoon aren't going to want to come and watch a Ghostbusters movie and not see Slimer, as you were saying. No way. That would be crazy. And what else? Now again, I don't want to upset anyone. But they attempted to make Janine look like she does in the real Ghostbusters, didn't they? Yes. It may not be a successful attempt to capture the character from the cartoon series, but Janine in the first movie and Janine in the second movie are very, very different in their appearance, particularly the hair, and also in the way they interact with the other characters. Although, like Slimer, Janine isn't actually given a chance to interact with the four Ghostbusters in Ghostbusters 2, which I think is a shame. And the Janine from the cartoon series is the bridge between the Janines from the two movies, played by Annie Potts in both movies, of course, showing some great versatility, I think. Annie Potts' Janine is terrific, I think. Well, the whole cast is terrific, isn't it? People are absolutely furious with the way Janine's character actually ended up in Ghostbusters 2. And they particularly don't like the way that her relationship with Egon was totally dropped. There are quite a few sort of theories and things about why this decision was made. I agree with you, I think you said it first. It's purely because they couldn't really think of anything to do with Lewis or Janine, so they just bung them together. That's absolutely right. They obviously decided at some point, we're making this second Ghostbusters movie, we want Rick Moranis as Lewis back, he's very funny. Yes, they're right, but in the first movie he has a very clear focus and is very relevant to the plot and fits into the movie very well. In the second he really is just tacked on to be Rick Moranis in the movie. Janine, there's not much opportunity for her to do her receptionist work or coordinating things for the Ghostbusters, who are off doing other things. So yes, Janine and Lewis are kind of lumped together, and given this relationship, and Egon and Janine isn't bothered to be revisited, which is partly why I'm sure I didn't remember that they had a relationship. Boo-hiss. 
which is very disappointing for fans of Janine and Janine and Egon. There's an interesting scene towards the end of Ghostbusters 2 where you have Lewis and Janine and Sigourney Weaver's character, Dana Barrett, all interacting in an apartment together. We're just about to reach the denouement at that point. And it always strikes me how different the interaction and relationships between those three characters are in the two movies. Does Janine really interact with Lewis or Dana in the first one? Well, she doesn't say very much to them. You've got, would you like some coffee, Mr. Tully? Ah, uh, yes, but he's possessed. And you've got Dana saying to Janine, is this the Ghostbusters office? Yes, it is. Very sort of professional interaction between Janine and the two characters there. But I think what's most interesting and different is the relationship between... Lewis and Dana. In the first movie, Lewis is a kind of a sex pest for Dana. He's her neighbour, and he's obviously been trying to get her to be interested in him, and she really isn't having any of it, and absolutely hates him and finds him a pest. But in the second movie, they seem very comfortable with each other, and obviously don't really interact a lot in everyday life, but they know each other, and are happy to rely on each other as allies. I guess maybe Dana's quite happy to come home and find him getting it on with Janine. Yes, that's right. It means he's not going to try it on with her anymore. One thing that people don't like about Ghostbusters 2, because fans of the original movie do have a lot of objections to it, one thing they don't like is that Janos really is just kind of doing the same thing as Lewis, being a sex pest for Dana and then getting himself possessed and involved with the big bad. Peter McNichol as Dr. Janusz Pohar, very, very amusing in the movie, and sinister as well in many ways, very well done. But that brings us nicely on to the big bad ghost in the movie, Vigo, who I think is a more accessible ghost for the young audience to get and interact with than the main ghost in the first movie, Goza. It's immediately clear who he is, what he's trying to do, all that kind of thing. Certainly when I was young, I understood exactly what was going on with Vigo. He was the spirit trapped in the painting. What he was trying to do, possess the baby and take over the world. How he was gaining his power with the mood slime, which the bad tempers of New York was fueling. Whereas with the first movie, it wasn't always very clear to me when I was young exactly what Goza was doing and how and why. And of course, I did always find Vigo, I want to say scarier, but more easy to see why he was scary. Yes, more threatening. Yes, more threatening, a more tangible threat that you can interact with as the audience, I always felt. And that's probably a symptom of the real Ghostbusters as well, gearing the ghost, the main ghost, towards the young audience who are going to be wanting to enjoy it like they have the cartoon. I'll tell you another thing. The Statue of Liberty always made more sense to me than the Stay Puft Marshmallow Man. Ah, yes. That's a lot more accessible and well-known around the world as a big thing stomping around at the end of the movie moment. Mm, of course, the Stay Puft Marshmallow Man is made up, isn't he, for the Ghostbusters? He is, but I think the young American audience would have found it easier to interact with that kind of logo character. I think they have it more than we do. I think so. I think they have more marshmallows than we do as well. Well, that's right. I mean, we might have been able to relate it to something like Tony the Tiger with Frosties. Cereal. Or... Or the Honey Monster with oh, Sugar Puffs. Yes, the Honey Monster. Or Coco the Monkey, but we... With Coco Pops. It's all cereal, isn't it, it's, your ideas? It's all cereal, which originates in America anyway, Kellogg's cereal. Oh, right. So, yeah, I think the idea of this big marshmallow mascot coming to life, for those reasons, is a lot more relatable for a young American audience. So we've talked quite a lot about the first Ghostbusters movie now anyway. Yes, we have. I'd like to say what I found rather horrifying when I was young. Ghostbusters, the first movie, was released in 1984. No plans at that point, I'm sure, for a cartoon and a big franchise of it. And so it is quite different with how it's pitched from the second movie. Now you tell us what horrifies you. Two things, really, I found rather horrifying. One was I spent half the movie thinking, well, where's Winston? Why is it just the three of them? Yes, indeed. Then, of course, later in the movie, Winston's saying things like, 
No offence, but I need my own lawyer. He doesn't really seem to be in the gang with them, as he is in Ghostbusters 2. Yes, and that's something, as we were saying, that the real Ghostbusters really establishes. It establishes the four Ghostbusters as the team, the awesome foursome. Yes, and Winston's always kind of on the fringes in the first movie. He doesn't turn up to way into it. It is true that movies at that sort of time sometimes felt obliged to introduce a token black character and that's really what Winston is they don't bother doing anything with him so thank goodness for the cartoon series there one of the things that people include when they're heaping praise on the real Ghostbusters quite rightly is that Winston was developed into a proper three-dimensional character not just a token black man so that's perhaps a drawback of the first movie we haven't mentioned, of course, the other Ghostbusters actor. We've mentioned three of them. Bill Murray as Dr. Peter Wegman, who is, I think, and I'm sure a lot of people would agree, the most accomplished comedy performer of the actors. Dan Aykroyd and Harold Ramis were really comedy writers who came in to play the Ghostbusters they created. I think Bill Murray's a terrific comedy actor. There's a lot of hate for Bill Murray on the forums. What a shame. He's blamed for there being no Ghostbusters 3, but I don't think that's a bad thing. I don't suppose it would have been very good. And that's reminded me, of course, we must talk about the new Ghostbusters movie at the end of the podcast. Oh, uh, yes. Must briefly, be mentioned. Very briefly. Um, also, apparently it's his fault that Lorenzo Music stopped voicing Peter in the cartoon. I've read about this. It's bizarre. He said something to imply that he didn't like Lorenzo Music, so they changed it, but then it turned out he was joking. I don't even know. It's weird, but um, getting back to the real Ghostbusters now... What do you think of Dave Coulier as a replacement for Lorenzo Music? Well, it's interesting. I've watched some of Dave Coulier's early episodes, such as The Grundle, and I thought he was actually doing a very good impression of Lorenzo Music in that. Ooh. But then in some of the very late episodes, which the ITV did show some of those in the 90s, I thought he was rather lacking as Peter's voice. And then when he turns up in Extreme Ghostbusters as Peter, I didn't think he recaptured the character that well. People have said this, why get rid of Lorenzo Music and then just have someone do an impression of Lorenzo Music? The whole thing is insane, I don't really understand it. But there's a lot of hate for Dave Coulier as well. If you're a hardcore real Ghostbusters fan and you love Lorenzo Music, I can absolutely understand that you wouldn't like someone replacing him. And people say that Dave Coulier does an appalling job as Peter and they really, really don't like it. They wouldn't want anyone, though, would they, instead of him? I don't know. I simply don't know. Again, I, I don't want to upset anyone. I can't hear what's so very, very wrong with it, but that's because I haven't grown up loving the real Ghostbusters and getting really, really into it. So, sorry about that. I could take or leave Dave Coulier. I do like Lorenzo Music's laid-back, deadpan style that he brings to his roles, not only as Peter Venkman, but as characters such as Garfield and one of the Gummy Bears, for example. But I do think that the poorer quality of some of the later Real Ghostbusters episodes that I've seen has more to do with less coherence in the scripts, aspects of dumbing down, I think, trying to comedy up Slimer and his mini-adventures, for example, taking the show off in a strange direction. So I think even if Lorenzo Music had stuck around, the later shows of The Real Ghostbusters would be noticeably poorer quality than the first couple of seasons. Well, speaking of Slimer, that brings me back to the other thing that I found rather shocking when I first watched Ghostbusters, the original movie. Slimer is, shall I say, antagonist? Well, yes. An antagonist. He's the first ghost that they catch, and he becomes something of a breakout character by being their cute little pet in the cartoon which is one of the many things where fans of the real Ghostbusters might come back to the original movie and think what the hell is going on here 
That's certainly what I thought when I watched it. I was like, whoa, they are busting Slimer. And I'd also seen Ghostbusters 2, don't forget. Ah, yes, of course. It is, uh, once you get over that, a very funny sequence, isn't it? The Hotel Slimer bust. It is a very funny sequence. But you have to come to terms with Slimer's role in the movie if you're expecting something different. And that's just one other thing that makes it less accessible for the younger, perhaps real Ghostbusters audience. Well, I've always said, yes, I prefer Ghostbusters 2. It's funnier, it's more engaging. I think that's because, largely, I watched it as a child, and it is better for children. It is much better, for the reasons we've said, for children. We watched the Ghostbusters movies over the past couple of weeks, in many ways, to prepare for this podcast. And we decided, didn't we, that they were probably, objectively, about equally funny, even though the second one is a lot more accessible to uh, the humour that a younger audience would engage with. Some of the jokes in Ghostbusters, I think we only started laughing at them within the last ten years, didn't we? You're absolutely right. Ghostbusters is more of a young adult, any adult really, kind of movie. It is very funny, but yes, we've really only started laughing out loud at things like the mass underwater sponge migration. Interest rates in the first year come to $95,000 in the past few years. So yes, that does back up the point. It's uh, it's not really for kids. Not so much. The other thing that we need to say about Ghostbusters 1984 original movie is that what is very obvious in it is that Egon and Janine, with her brown hair, and Egon's brown hair as well, of course. Oh yes, all brown hair. Which he doesn't have in the cartoon, which is why it's worth saying, are having their relationship. Now, it seems, of course, that Janine is very keen on Egon, and it could be misconstrued that he's not really interested in her and is trying to rebuff her advances. But, of course, like in the cartoon, he doesn't really know what to do with it, and how to interact with her, which is quite an interesting character trait of his. Yes, people love the spores, moulds and fungus line. I found a collection of screenshots from the first movie on one of the Ghostbusters forums that show Egon and Janine supporting each other, holding hands and things, that shows they do have a developing relationship, which is developed in the cartoon. Shout out to Nikki. That was her. Oh, that was her, wasn't yeah. it? I wasn't sure who it was. For me, that was actually very consistent with what I noticed in the cartoon. I thought, oh yes, Egon doesn't like Janine particularly, but she likes him. Of course, I was quite wrong. I wasn't bothered by her brown hair, because everyone had brown hair. Egon and Ray had brown hair in the movie and not in the cartoon. But what did surprise me was that her glasses were only reading glasses. Oh! I do remember thinking, actually, watching Ghostbusters for the first time... The movie, yeah, Janine's different, but um, wasn't a major thing. I think we could perhaps bridge the gap now to Extreme Ghostbusters by me finishing my Egon and Janine recollections. And we'll come on to the circumstances of how we came to be watching Extreme Ghostbusters in a moment, but it's very obvious when one does watch Extreme Ghostbusters that Janine and Egon are having a relationship which Egon isn't really fully aware of and Janine is trying to pursue rather actively. And I said to Rosie at one point, it's interesting how in Extreme Ghostbusters they've brought back the Egon and Janine relationship, which we haven't seen since the first movie 13 years earlier. And Rosie said... I said something along the lines of, what the hell are you talking about? It was all over the real Ghostbusters. So of course I hadn't remembered that. And Rosie had. But of course the second movie had very much discouraged me from having any inklings of remembering it. But now Rosie will tell us about Extreme Ghostbusters and how we came to have it in our lives. Extreme Ghostbusters is the best TV show ever. Apart from Nightmare. Well, that's a matter of opinion. There's actually a lot of detail about how I discovered... Extreme Ghostbusters on my Extreme Ghostbusters fan site, if you can find the page called EGB and Me. It was on CITV in late 1997. Slash early 1998, I think the original run continued. That sounds right. And I remember seeing promos 
and thinking, do I want to watch that? Hmm, I don't know. And then catching the last two, three, four minutes. It must have been on before something I wanted to watch. And I was drawn in by the last two, three, four minutes of a few episodes. And I kept thinking, I must, I must remember to watch that all the way through next week. And finally, I did. Perhaps I'll butt into the story a moment here to say I had seen Extreme Ghostbusters listed in the Radio Times, which was our TV listings magazine of choice, and I had thought to myself, Ghostbusters, meh, because of my feelings about the real Ghostbusters. And I thought something like they put Extreme on the front, it's probably really ultra, uber, modern and crap. I remember I thought Extreme Ghostbusters was a silly title, and I still think so, but, you know, that which we call a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. Apparently everything was called Extreme in those days. The only one that I think really made it over here, apart from Extreme Ghostbusters, was Extreme Dinosaurs, so uh, that wasn't too much of an issue for me. Yes, it would have been a couple of years later they'd have called it Ghostbusters 2000, It's just a symptom of marketing of the time. But the title has nothing to do with the quality of the show. It is quite understandably, I should say, despised by some people who are huge real Ghostbusters fans or Ghostbusters movie fans and were hoping to see more of the original Ghostbusters. The style and feel are very, very different from the real Ghostbusters. And, of course, the characters are not habitually there, apart from Egon, Janine and Slimer. There's a comment on a YouTube video, isn't there? This has nothing to do with Ghostbusters. And I can see why some people would think that. It is possible, and perhaps better, and advisable, to judge Extreme Ghostbusters as its own entity and on its own merits, which I'm sure Rosie would like to tell us about at length. Yes, of course there's the camp who loved the real Ghostbusters and did, as you advise, Jake, and judged Extreme Ghostbusters on its own merit and thought, eh, it's not as good as the real Ghostbusters, but I kind of like it anyway. I think if you are a huge original Ghostbusters fan, you can't get away from that influencing you. But that's not me. I wasn't a massive real Ghostbusters fan. So I am looking at Extreme Ghostbusters purely from the point of view of someone who likes it as its own thing. Of course, when I started watching it, I thought, hey, this is much better than the real Ghostbusters. The atmosphere is much less frivolous. It's got real, proper, deep characterization. Now, perhaps I was young and hadn't picked up those things in the real Ghostbusters, and they are there in abundance, but it certainly didn't seem that way to me at the time. Another thing people object to, of course, is they say, oh, it's too pc You know, because obviously New York doesn't have any black people or Hispanic people or disabled people or women. Yes, we could mention the the extreme Ghostbusters characters here because they are all designed to be what we might have called at the time a minority. Yes, it's like a white able-bodied man is the default Ghostbuster and one thing has been changed for all four of them, I suppose. You have Kylie Griffin, who is a girl. You have Eduardo Rivera, who is Hispanic. You have Garrett Miller, who is a white male, yes, but he's in a wheelchair because he is disabled, or differently abled, as we might have said slightly later than the time. (laughs) And then, of course, we have Roland Jackson, who, like Winston, is a black person. Personally, I don't see what that's got to do with anything, and I look forward to living in a world where people wouldn't comment on such things. But anyway, that's that point made, I think. Yes, that's right. We shouldn't notice these differences and remark on them, really, and think of them as extreme. But it is true that, perhaps, on the television, in the media at the time, these aspects of the characters wouldn't have been considered normal. And so, like everything, Extreme Ghostbusters is a product of its time, and it was a changing time. I mean, if they made it now, they would put in an overtly gay Ghostbuster, wouldn't they? But in 1997, there was still a huge stigma attached to that sort of thing on the television. Having a gay kiss in EastEnders and things in the late 90s was a huge thing, so perhaps wasn't ready for children's television. So we must look at these things in the context of their time, mustn't we? 
if you type Extreme Ghostbusters into Google, one of the first things that comes up, about six pages before my website, is an article about how Extreme Ghostbusters won an award for a positive portrayal of a disabled character. And it says things like, when we tried the cartoon on our focus groups, the kids didn't think of Garrett as a disabled character and they always called him by name. Which just goes to show that times were changing and the innocent mind of the younger generation is where the positive changes will come from. Shout out to Dawn, who sent me a very nice email about my website and told me that her little nephews used to like Garrett best and they used to go around in her computer chair pretending to be him. Which, of course, wasn't inappropriate or inconsiderate of anyone's feelings. It was just the pure innocence of a child. And if you want that theme expanded on more... What's the episode of South Park called Chef Goes Nanas, but I digress. Let's talk about the four extreme Ghostbusters. Let's do them in order of least favourite to favourite. So that means we have to start with Roland. Roland has been called boring, with some justification. He's a very kind of together sort of person. He's calm and collected and clever and sensible and gets on with things quietly and those are good character traits it does make him less engaging to watch than uh, other kinds of characters you can infer from many episodes that Roland is an older brother in quite an extensive family and I think Roland's most interesting moments come from the family-like relationships he's developing in the ghost-busting team. I think particularly there of the Grundle. Roland, as a supportive friend to Kylie in that episode, is terrific, and there's a very significant line towards the end that he says. Kylie's told us that Jack, who uh, got got by the Grundle, was her only friend, and then Roland pops up at the end with, no one touches my family or my friends. Mm. You're like, aha, they're friends. Kylie has another friend. So it's um, it's very much Roland is most interesting, I think, that episode. I've said that the extreme Ghostbusters and the real Ghostbusters has an episode called The Grundle. What are they both called? Is the extreme one actually called The Grundle? No, it's called Grundlesque. Grundlesque. And the real Ghostbusters episode is called The, the Grundle. Grundle yes. Yeah. yes, that's right. The Grundle is a very interesting and frightening ghost character who tries to tempt children to be naughty. And the way he hangs around outside your bedroom window going, come out and play, child, come out and play. Very sinister. Very sinister. Maurice LaMarche, who, of course, voiced Egon, voicing him there in the Extreme Ghostbusters episode and doing an excellent job. And I don't think it was him in the original Ghostbusters I episode. I think we discovered that it wasn't. It wasn't. So I, I think Maurice LaMarche as the Grundle is... The right grundle for me, but perhaps that's just because I like Extreme Ghostbusters more than real. The other interesting Roland episode is Sonic Youth, isn't it? Yes, because he gets controlled by the Ghost of the Week siren and starts acting out of character. And then you realise how much you as an audience and his friends, teammates, take him for granted because when his solidness, reliability, dependability, when they're all gone, then you really start to notice and you think, hey, we need the old Roland back. He's like a kind of pillar of strength at the centre of the team, isn't he, that you don't really notice. It's there. It's the aspect of him being a big brother at home. He's like a kind of big brother to them all in the team. Very much so. I'll tell you what else I think he has going for him. He can be quite amusing, actually. He's voiced, of course, by Alfonso Ribeiro, who played Carlton Banks in The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, a comedy show. And when he gets a funny line to say, he says it very well. So perhaps you have to dig a little deeper with Roland to find what makes him a good character, but it is there. Next up the ranks is Garrett, whom we have already talked about a little. Of course, his big thing is that he's handicapable. He's very confident, very happy with who he is. He's always cracking jokes and that kind of thing, which I think is why the young children liked him. They found him very engaging. And he's quite at ease with his disability and his wheelchair. Which is a very positive lesson for the audience. Not just disabled members of the audience, but everyone who can be encouraged to feel good about themselves, whatever pros and cons we all have, thanks to Garrett's attitude. Another objection that I have read, which is really rather bigoted, is that, um, oh, someone couldn't be a Ghostbuster if they were in a wheelchair. 
But here's what I say to that. Garrett's been in a wheelchair since birth, and we're all born helpless, and we make the best of what we have as we grow. There are times when the wheelchair seems to kind of save the day and become a bit much, but there are also times when Garrett does need a bit of help, like we all do. We do indeed. And he can't go up the stairs with them a couple of times. And I think most of the time it's realistically handled. I said about that attitude, didn't I, that it's like birds making their own version of Ghostbusters and then watching our version of Ghostbusters and saying, oh, well, you couldn't possibly be a Ghostbuster if you can't fly. I would like to see that, bird Ghostbusters. Um, I also think of a show called Raven, which I think most Ghostbusters audiences won't know about, but it was this sort of uh, game show where you had to do physical things. And if someone said, do you think someone could go on Raven who had only one hand? Your first instinct would be to say, no, of course not. But actually, a contestant who had one hand did very well on Raven. Yes, Wenra from Series 4. Through to the final week there, and perhaps was unlucky not to get further than he did. Raven ran on Children's BBC from 2002 to 2010, so we won't talk about it very much, but that was certainly relevant to this point. That point being, I think, that we judge too much from our own standards of what others are and aren't capable of, whereas really, we don't know. So Garrett should not be criticised in any way. Or the idea of Garrett should not be criticised in any way. From that point of view. Voiced very engagingly, very amusingly, very compellingly, of course, by Jason Marsden. And when we used to watch it, I used to think, where have I heard that voice before? And it was principally as Peter Pan in Peter Pan and the Pirates, which he does with the same sort of gusto and lust for life. He's a terrific voice actor. You can hear him doing that voice variations on it in a lot of things. Hocus Pocus, The Weekenders, for example. And it's always enjoyable to hear. Well, I think that's all we really need to say about Garrett. So let's go on to Kylie, who is the second most appealing character in this house. She's actually the one that people who are only kind of Extreme Ghostbusters fans like best... And there's a lot to like about her as a character. Actually, a lot of people are really quite pervy about her. You can find pictures of her looking suggestive and covered in green slime and uh, offering her feet to the viewer to tickle and things like that. And uh, there's a whole blog post somewhere about this person who liked seeing her covered in maggots in a sexual way. So that's one reason that she appeals to people. A better reason, I think, is that she is a very deep, very interesting character. She's obviously had a lot of troubles to overcome in her life with her family situation and with people's perceptions of her. On the official Extreme Ghostbusters website, which I haven't mentioned yet because it's got a lot of nonsense on it, it has some backstory that never made it into the show about how her parents poo-pooed her and said... She would never find the ghost of Grandma Rose and how people at school uh, would bully her for being a brain, a bit of a geek. And then when she started being a goth, they started to call her a freak and all that kind of thing. There is a lot of rubbish on that website, but that rings true, I think. That reminds me of the very interesting point that the Extreme Ghostbusters are meant to be quite a bit younger than the real Ghostbusters were in their cartoon and films, and they are very much still growing up. They are 18 years old, essentially, aren't they, the Extreme Ghostbusters? Yes. And a lot of growing up has been done by the time you're 18, but everyone still has quite a bit of growing up to do at that point, no matter how they might feel about it at the time. I think we all feel pretty grown up at 18, don't we? You look back and realise that you weren't. You weren't at all. You, you're certainly on the path of who you're going to be, but there's a lot of experiences and many bitter ones coming up that are going to help you finish growing up. And there's a, a lot of growing up themes in Extreme Ghostbusters. 
And you can see that there are lots of formative experiences which they do have, which I always enjoy. That's a huge reason, actually, why I like it. My favourite things all involve characters in their formative years. I think that's another objection that I read, actually. Oh, they're too young, they're just kids, I want a show with grown-ups in it. But I don't feel that way, personally. Mm, makes it more interesting. It certainly does if you like that sort of thing, anyway. Which we do, as you'll find out in many of our upcoming podcasts. That website, of course, says that Kylie and Garrett are 17. Huge controversies and arguments about that. And uh, a lot of people say, oh, yes, Kylie must be 17, because in Grundlesque she says she was seven ten years ago. But then if you ask Fritz, he says that Grundle, the Grundle episode was 12 years ago anyway. And that website obviously has some rejected ideas, such as Eduardo dreams of being an Olympic runner. So I don't think we can set too much store by the stuff that doesn't ring true. Yeah, the stuff on there is taken from the kind of series Bible stage of the development of the show, and there will inevitably be ideas that haven't made it into the final cut. The Extreme Ghostbusters are college students, so they must be at least 18 years old, in the Grundle episode, they're talking about the real Ghostbusters one being ten years ago. Of course, we all use ten years to mean about ten years. Mm, they're rounding down. So, Kylie was seven twelve years ago. She's eighteen going on nineteen, which makes perfect sense. Mm, that fits. What people, I think, quite rightly, uh, notice about her character and latch onto is that she's got her dead grandma Rose, which has had a huge influence on who she is and how she feels and the way she acts. She has a very personal interest in the paranormal because of that, and she puts up walls and defends her tender feelings quite fiercely and doesn't let them show. And she's got this really weird thing about older men, of course, because of her daddy issues, we can infer. Yes, uh, three pieces of evidence, Egon Ray and Leonard Bates in the episode Till Death Do Us Start. It's very easy to watch Extreme Ghostbusters and think Kylie is the deepest, most interesting character, because overtly she is. But the fourth Ghostbuster... Eduardo Rivera. Voiced by Reno Romano, who went on to have great success voicing Batman, I believe. And if you type in Spider-Man, I don't know why I've ever done that, but uh, one thing that comes up is Reno Romano was the best ever Spider-Man. So people seem to like his Spider-Man even more than his Batman. Has perhaps even more depth than Kylie. And we should mention at this point that Kylie is voiced by Tara Strong. Then Tara Charendorf. Who has voiced practically every American cartoon over the past sort of 20 years. She's very talented. She's absolutely terrific. She's quite famous for being Dill in Rugrats and Timmy in The Fairly Old Parents and Raven in Teen Titans. Ben 10? And Ben 10, of course, mm. in the original Ben 10 series. She doesn't voice him when he's teenaged. But a very versatile and prolific voice actress. And doesn't she do an excellent job as Kylie? Yes, she's absolutely fantastic. And she was only about 24 I at think, the time. Yes, I think 24 we worked out. And I think Reno Romano was 28. Very impressive stuff. There is, going back to Reno Romano, um, somewhere there's an interview, an audio interview with him. It's uh, I've got a link to it on uh, Fritz's forum somewhere, I think. And... I have to say, the questions are absolutely dire. They come from a movie-slash-real Ghostbusters fan. They're not much to do with Extreme Ghostbusters at all, but the answers that he gives and the things that he manages to speak about are absolutely fascinating. And you can really tell he had great enthusiasm for the show. He really understood the character. And one thing that's quite interesting that he reveals is that they went through a few, at least one other anyway, um... Eduardo's before they settled on him, and he's got this amusing story about Jason Marsden coming to speak to him, and he says, oh, well, we haven't met, and Jason says, oh, you look just like the other guy. <laughs> <laughs> so um, they obviously quite carefully chose him, and uh, it took a little while to get it right, but thank goodness they found him. The phrase that always comes to my mind when thinking about Eduardo is, still waters run deep. Eduardo is even more reserved about showing any of himself to his contemporaries, or indeed anyone, than Kylie is. 
but there's a lot brewing beneath the surface, as becomes very obvious to us and to the other characters during the course of the series. I said Kylie puts up walls, but on the other hand, she really doesn't mind talking about her feelings and Grandma Rose and all that kind of thing. Whereas Eduardo, you can see, if you look very carefully, there are times when he's obviously thinking something and feeling something, and he simply won't let on. Very carefully portrayed, of course, not only in the animation, but in how Reno delivers the lines around Eduardo's revealing silences. Very, very skillfully done. Absolutely. I'll tell you another sort of EGB research insight. People like me, who are Extreme Ghostbusters fans only, and connected with that show, and don't particularly want to talk about the original Ghostbusters or Back in the Saddle, and they all seem to have vanished now, but if you can find traces of them, they liked Eduardo best as well. All their fan fiction is about Eduardo and his still waters running deep, which I think is quite interesting. And they all like his relationship with Kylie, of course, which is an absolutely fascinating part of the show. And of course, his feelings for Kylie are one of the things, or some of the things, uh, that he likes to conceal. And that's why they have this love-hate relationship, and she's the same way, of course. To her, he comes across as insensitive, slacker. Useless prick was uh, one one, uh, phrase about him that I saw written somewhere. And she's very protective of her feelings and doesn't want to get involved with somebody like that. And he is very protective of his feelings and doesn't want to let her in, which is why he comes across in that way. It's great how Kylie obviously realises throughout the series that there is a lot more to Eduardo than meets the eye. You get, first of all, oh, Eduardo's not so bad once you scratch the surface, and then she'll get on to actually thinking, hang on, I'm falling in love with him. And of course, because Kylie's prepared to talk to some extent about her feelings to the other characters, we get to know more what she's thinking about Eduardo than what Eduardo is thinking about her. Yes. But his actions towards Kylie, the way he is with her... Facial expressions. The dream he has, erotic dream he has about her. Oh, that was surprising, wasn't it? See ITV at quarter past four. All that stuff does speak volumes. And Eduardo and Kylie is a very compelling, developing love story, different from Eagle and Janine on many levels. Mm, You wouldn't want to do it the same, would you? You want something a bit different. And certainly more accessible to me at the time as a relationship I wanted to engage with. I don't know if it would be true for all teenage viewers. Mm, We were a little older, weren't we? If you were young, like when I was watching The Real Ghostbusters and thinking, oh, Janine likes Egon, you might just think, oh, Eduardo likes Kylie, and not get that it was reciprocated. Yes, Egon and Janine's relationship is funny, isn't it? Whereas Eduardo and Kylie's isn't. Even though I'm sure they're both rooted in true, deep feelings, you can do a lot more comedy with Egon and Janine. As in one of my very favourite Extreme Ghostbusters episodes, The Crawler, which has some great Egon and Janine comedy. By the way, I think the useless prick comment was in the same place as this has nothing to do with Ghostbusters, along with Eduardo got turned into Kylie's cat, therefore he saw her naked. Yes, yeah, so we must take all that with a, a pinch of salt, mustn't we? <laughs> yes, I don't think she was actually naked, was she? What episodes are particularly good for Eduardo and Kylie? The one where he gets turned into her cat or goes into her cat's body and shares it, which is be careful what you wish for. Mm-hmm. There's also... The Unseen, where they have to go off together and retrieve the proton guns. Which is where she says that water's not so bad, isn't it? Once you scratch the surface. And what's the one where he saves her from falling off the balcony? Oh, well, that's Seeds of Destruction. That's a funny one. That, overall, is very good for Kylie's character and Garrett's character, and quite bad for Eduardo's character. And saving her from falling off the balcony isn't particularly deep, is it? So it's not one of my favourites. Sorry for stepping on your point there. I quite like that scene. Not so much the fact that he saves her from falling off the balcony, 
but the look and tiny bit of interplay between them afterwards. I thought yeah. it was going to be street pizza, not while I'm around. Showing a bit of his feelings there, showing their relationship is developing. The way that they look at each other afterwards is very good. Well done, the animators. In your dreams, of course, the one with the erotic dream, Kylie's quite interested to learn that Eduardo dreams about her, and he immediately has to put up the wall of, it was a nightmare, okay? Very telling. Very telling. Very nice dialogue in that exchange between them on the roof. Very well acted. Unfortunately, that's one of the bits of Extreme Ghostbusters where the animation on the faces doesn't match the quality of the writing and the acting, which is a bit of a shame. That whole episode, you keep thinking, oh, they look really weird. Of course, the technical term is off-model, off isn't model, it? Yeah. Some unfortunate animation in that episode. But of course, that of the three aspects, writing, acting, animation, is, I think, the least important to get the point across. I think so. But then, of course, there's Till Death Do Us Start, that fantastic scene where they are are talking about their feelings um, and saying what they want to do with their futures and Kylie says, you know what I want? And Eduardo just, it's possibly even only two frames of animation. He just flicks his eyes over to look at her. We know he wants to know what Kylie wants, even though he's not ready to say, oh yes, I do want to know, or even think to himself, I do want to know. Yep. He does want to know instinctively. But the other characters can't see that. And then, when it comes to his turn, instead of saying what he wants in the future, he starts a pillow fight. And that's the Leonard Bates episode, and Leonard's there kind of making this face like, oh, they're so immature, because Eduardo started this pillow fight and Gareth's joined in, because he doesn't know still waters run deep. And then, it gets really quite dodgy when the ghost turns up and Kylie has to seduce Leonard to uh, lure her out of the mirror, and uh, Eduardo's getting very jealous. And very, it... very quickly comes in with, hey, this is stupid, man, this mm-hmm. plan. It's uh, probably more showing his feelings than he would have liked at that point. Yes, but hey, this is stupid, man. It's not saying, don't do that, I'm jealous, is it? Yes, very true. He, he, His brain won't let him come in and actually talk about his feelings, even if he's very clearly showing them. Mm. And then there's this very nice shot when it's all over and the ghost is trapped. He just sort of takes a second to process what's happened and then sort of mooches off. Very nice. Very deep. One of the very best, possibly the very best, episodes of Extreme Ghostbusters is Rage, which is all about Eduardo. Now, this does have hints of Kylie and Eduardo relationship in it, but mainly it's about Eduardo, his backstory, and his deeply internalised feelings, and it's extremely revealing, but extremely subtly done. We meet his older brother, much older brother, Carlos, or Carl, as he prefers, who is a very aggressive cop, and his interaction with Eduardo, he's just yelling at him all the time, having a go at him, pulling him around with his physical strength. And you can see, looking at that, Eduardo has this all the time in his life, you can see why he doesn't want to reveal his true feelings, because if he ever did uh, to his brother, they would just get totally shut down. We can infer from this episode that Eduardo and Carl's father was a cop and is now dead, it seems to us. Everyone says... No longer a cop, probably deceased, and I think they're right about yeah, that. Yeah, that's, that's a very good summary of it, isn't it? We can tell that Carl has experienced racial problems in his career as a policeman. He is uncomfortable with his heritage. He has married a white woman and named their son Kevin, and is trying to be... A white man. He calls Eduardo Eddie. And as I mentioned, insists on being called Carl. So he is very uncomfortable with himself, Carl, and can't understand why Eduardo doesn't feel the same way. Now, as is typical with Eduardo, he doesn't go around saying, yeah, I'm proud of my Hispanic heritage, but... You can tell from certain aspects of his character that he is at ease with his Hispanic heritage. He calls himself Eduardo rather than Eddie. 
he speaks Spanish in... In everyday conversation. Yes, everyday conversation. He has exactly. little Spanish phrases. Little Spanish phrases he chucks in. He, he doesn't mind people knowing that he is Hispanic. And this is reflected in the episode by Eduardo's attitude to being a Ghostbuster. Carl has a lot of prejudices against the Ghostbusters, and Eduardo won't tell Carl that he himself is a Ghostbuster, and the end of the episode is all about Eduardo coming out and saying, I'm proud to be a Ghostbuster, and Carl having to accept that because of the situation. I always think Eduardo's not just saying, I'm proud to be a Ghostbuster, he's saying, I'm proud to be whatever I am, and you have to accept that, Carl. Mm, very good. My favourite thing is Kevin calling him Uncle Eduardo to his face and calling him Uncle Eddie when he speaks to Carl. Kevin is very shrewd about how he speaks to his relatives. And I actually think, continuing my point from just now, that the fact that Kevin is extremely interested in the Ghostbusters, and that's very at odds with his father's view of the Ghostbusters, means that Kevin is very open and interested in his Hispanic heritage. And perhaps at some point this will cause some sort of conflict between father and son. That dinner scene is very good, where Carl is slagging off the Ghostbusters, and Kevin's saying, you met the Ghostbusters? And he's all excited. And then you get Egon trying to reveal that Eduardo's a Ghostbuster, and Eduardo totally shutting him down. And then later on, Egon wants to talk about it, and Eduardo goes, I'm not having this conversation. Are you that intimidated by your brother? Intimidated, that's a good word. It's it's a, such a quick exchange, but it's very subtly done to contain a lot of characterization and revelations about Eduardo as a character. It's an extraordinarily well-judged episode. Props to the animators again. There's this wonderful scene where they actually find Eduardo ghostbusting in their house. And Kevin's been saying, Uncle Edward is a Ghostbuster? Radical! And um, Eduardo's facial expressions there, he's looking down at Kevin, who's smaller than him, and looking really sort of touched and pleased. And then Carl comes along, and his eyes and his face move upwards, and his whole expression just changes into, oh my gosh, now I'm for it. I think, uh, to Eduardo, Carl represents a kind of dark aspect of his life that he's trying to get away from and Kevin represents the hopes for the future where he and his family will come to terms with himself. Deep man. And these people who used to write Eduardo fan fiction and love Eduardo, they always, or very nearly always, at least mention Carl, even if he's not actually in it. Yeah, that one episode gives you all the fuel for various types of fan fiction that you will ever need. Eduardo's extended family, there is so much to do with them. They they could have their own spin-off. There's so much material potentially there. Thank goodness the ITV showed it, because I actually skipped... An awful lot of drudge. I have to admit, EGB does have some stinkers. I suppose 40 episodes, it's inevitable. But uh, CITV skipped some of the drudge to show Rage as the last episode that they showed, and thank goodness for it. One of the ones they skipped was Till Death Do a Start. I suspect it was too sexy. Yes, there was another one they cut which has a bit to overt um, racial prejudice in it. That's right. Uh, the True Face of a Monster. Yeah. So they did want to be a bit, well, a bit too PC, a bit too extreme with the ones they showed. That one's very subtle as well. Garrett's old friend is trying to convince his new gang to let Garrett in, and it's not explicitly said, but very much implied, do we really want a wheelchair guy hanging out with us? We better find out if he's racist first, is basically what it comes down to. They take him to um, vandalise the synagogue. Yeah. It's There's a lot beneath the surface in Extreme Ghostbusters, and the surface is a children's cartoon rebooting or attempting to reboot the Ghostbusters franchise. But as you can tell, there's a lot to analyse beneath that level. Perhaps we can round off our talk about Extreme Ghostbusters by mentioning 
Back in the Saddle, which is the two-part series finale, and reintroduces the three real Ghostbusters who aren't regulars in the series, Peter, Ray, and Winston, into the programme. Peter and Winston both voiced by their second voice actors from the real Ghostbusters. Dave Coulier, as we know, was Peter, and Buster Jones as Winston. He was originally voiced by Arsenio, Arsenio Hall, Hall, that's, that's the one. Name. And drawn to look slightly older. A lot older, that's uh, one thing people don't like about it. And Back in the Saddle has been the subject of discussion in the past, hasn't it? I think it's a good and apt idea for a season finale, have the real Ghostbusters as guests. There is a group of people who are real Ghostbusters fans and say, oh yes, I, lo- I like extreme Ghostbusters. Oh, I love Back in the Saddle. And it's all they really want to talk about. And if you're a real Ghostbusters fan who kind of liked extreme Ghostbusters, I can understand that. Unfortunately, from an EGB fan point of view, I tend to look at it more as the real Ghostbusters come along and encroach on my cartoon. Eight Ghostbusters, even in a double episode, is too many. It's a little too ambitious for its own good, I think, the concept of having all of them there ghostbusting. They didn't do themselves any favours by having the two episodes be two separate stories. If it was more of a two-parter, then they could spread the characterisation out a bit more. Yes, I was surprised by the incoherence between the two parts, really. Yes, the second episode starts with Garrett and Peter fishing and matching jumpers. And I do remember being rather surprised to see that. As a season finale, it has certain advantages. The fact that the old characters are back for a guest shot being one of them. They save the world in the last episode from the Bermuda Triangle creature. That's something you'd expect from a season finale. Egon reaches his 40th birthday, and you think perhaps going out to dinner with Janine for it might mean that perhaps they'll eventually sort themselves out. But one thing that I do find very pleasing about it is that the Eduardo and Kylie arc is revisited, and they do seem to have reached a position, Eduardo and Kylie, where they're becoming more comfortable around each other and seem to be developing a good relationship. It's more kind of Kylie gets in trouble and Eduardo rescues her kind of stuff. But it's true, isn't it, that they do seem less snappy and snipey with each other and they seem to have developed their relationship to a positive point. They do do their love-hate, of course, because uh, you want to see that as a fan. But yes, you can certainly see them making progress throughout the series and if you want to read in the, about that in great detail have a look at my shippers page on my website love hate relationships can be difficult a lot of them have too much hate it seems that usually the girl hates the boy one i always cite about that is hermione and ron in harry potter where's the love i always say about that one yes and the only time they can really get the love in if, if one of them's being jealous and what about How to Train Your Dragon? That had that, didn't it, with the main character and the that girl? That girl is just a complete cow to him. I don't know why he likes her. So the Abado and Kylie relationship does a good job of actually being love-hate, with both aspects being in there. Simultaneously, that's how to do it. The other one, I think, does that really, really successfully is Alvin and Brittany on yeah. the Chipmunks. You can read all about how they were my first ever ship if you if you look at my Extreme Ghostbusters website because there is a section for that. And I'm sure we'll talk more about Alvin and Brittany and the Chipmunks in the near future. Definitely. But if you do want to see how the second season of Extreme Ghostbusters should have gone, if it was ever made, you can read that on our Extreme Ghostbusters website as well, because it's there as a fan season. On the whole, Ghostbusters is a franchise I enjoy. I enjoy watching the movies regularly, Extreme Ghostbusters regularly, and dipping in and out of the real Ghostbusters for some interesting episodes is something I have enjoyed doing at times. And I think Rosie feels the same way about the movies, and Extreme Ghostbusters is her favourite pet show. Yes, I enjoy obsessing about Extreme Ghostbusters. Like I enjoy obsessing about Nightmare, the subject of our first podcast. So, before we wrap up, let's just say a quick word about the fact that there is, this year, 2016, a new Ghostbusters movie coming out to reboot the franchise 
It's not a sequel to the first two movies. It's a reboot in a new universe, which is different from Jurassic World, which is a franchise reboot in the same universe as the first three movies. And it's USP, if you like, is that it's going to have four female Ghostbusters. I've uh, read, um, I suppose, four different basic attitudes on that. One of them is, oh, it's all girls, that's so gimmicky, which is a disgusting attitude. One attitude is, oh, it's going to be awful, I'm not going to watch it. One is, oh, I'm so excited, hooray, new Ghostbusters. And the fourth one is the one where I sit, well, I'll watch it and see what it's like. I think it will be very interesting to see the attempt to reboot the franchise. I wonder if it'll be any good. It might be a case of you'd have to judge it on its own merits and not really think of it as Ghostbusters as we know it. Or it might pay really good homage to the originals and fit into the franchise really well. Or it might be complete rubbish in both ways. I really try not to have prejudices and make assumptions because they're quite often wrong but you know thoughts come unbidden to your mind and my thought at the moment is it's going to be one of those 2010s comedies that i just find appalling yeah it probably will be actually but perhaps it won't be and hopefully there'll be something there to enjoy if not a lot so the jury's very much out on that one in fact the jury hasn't assembled yet because the film isn't out yet (laughs) So there may be more to say about Ghostbusters in the future. So that will bring our Ghostbusters podcast to an end. But do join us again for our next podcast, which will be on the subject of the Masters of the Universe franchise. Jake's choice this time? Perhaps a more easily recognisable way to sum up that franchise would be He-Man. Do join us for that. I'm sure it will be fascinating and perhaps controversial. Well, maybe. It will certainly be as interesting as this. And until then, good night out there. Whatever you are.